Okay, brothers, it is 10 o'clock. Let's see if we can do some, uh, some wrap-up of this whole topic. Ye that have made it all the way to the bitter end. I have to tell you first, though, what a joy it's been worshiping with you. That has been fabulous. I love that we didn't have all the resources in front of us because we didn't need them. They were in our hearts, and we sang them out. And way to go. All right, we've seen that when our preaching is apostolic preaching, it proclaims the Christ, we're told by the prophets, who through the events of his life, that climax in the cross, the resurrection, they, they, they return and his return to the Father, give us the gift of forgiveness of sins and eternal life, and that he deposits these gifts for us in specific places, and that he summons us to invite his people together to those places as we wait for him to return in glory as judge of all. In other words, the kerygma, but the kerygma with the for you-ness of the means of grace. We also saw, the second time that we were together, that this preaching has a context in which it lives, a liturgical context, composed of a church year, because there's too much joy in our Lord's life and ministry to fit into a single celebration, and a liturgical context that's shaped by the passages that are read from God's word and proclaims the gospel from those passages, not just by reading them, not just by sermonizing on them, but also by having the royal priesthood of the baptized participate in proclaiming them in hymn and liturgy, song and prayer. And uh, I didn't mention, I should have, for help in selecting hymns, you know, you've got your hymnal selection guide, and I think that's integrated into uh, the Lutheran Service Builder. But my office also, if you check out the Unwrapping the Gifts website, we'll put out hymn suggestions for the three-year and the one-year series, both of them. And uh, the three-year are selected by Cantor Henry Garricky, and very good stuff on how to, how to proclaim. Also, we saw that this exists in a liturgical context where the big move is from the word to the element so that it becomes sacrament. Verabum acedit ad elementum et fit sacramentum. And I neglected to point this out, but of course it's obvious that's the pattern of incarnation. The word, the eternal word, comes to the element that is flesh so that the flesh becomes full of grace and truth. And so you can see why uh, the uh, the way St. Leo would rejoice in the end, he says the incarnation continues in the sacraments, plural, meaning the mysteries, the, uh, the Lord's Supper. We also saw that these readings in this liturgical context take place in an ecclesial context, a body of believers that you're part of that reaches all the way back to the ages and has thought about these readings a long time before you were ever a twinkle in your daddy's eye. And therefore, they have great insights to give you along the way. We're part of a body, not isolated individuals. As we receive the stories, who's being preached and heard quite literally forms the pilgrim throng across the years. And we also noted that we're part, as Lutherans, of a particular Reformation heritage, who, where the pilgrims rejoice in receiving preaching particularly as comfort, comfort to terrified consciences. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but this ties directly to the unity of the explanation of the first commandment. How does it go again? We should have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. If you trust what God says in his word of law, you fear his wrath and are terrified. If you trust what God says in his promises of gospel, you love him for the great grace that he shows you. Both of them find their unity in the fact that what God says is absolutely trustworthy. The last little bit of our time together, I would like to spend in reflections more practical on preaching, um, but in that bigger context. I mentioned the problem that, that what some would call biblical literacy or biblical illiteracy, and that it's a problem particularly for us pastors too. And I'd like to suggest a twofold approach here Actually, I think the scriptures suggest it. First, that you live in the word, and second, that the word lives in you. For you to live in the word, that's when you treat the scriptures like a delightful old house, huge and rambling, 
and it's your home. And you wander through it and explore the nooks and the crannies and the secrets in the attics and the basements and the closets, often as you did as a child on a rainy day. It's your home. And it's only by these wanderings around that you will pick up questions like, why did the Holy Spirit think it's important that we know that Benaiah killed a lion in a cistern on the day that the snow fell? I posted that on Facebook a while back and somebody said, oh, it's easy, it's right out of, out of Aslan. You know, and the, wind, the lion, the, the, it, 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 was always, it, was always, it was always winter and Satan's like a roaring lion and Benaiah, the son of Yahweh, comes and kills the lion and the winter's over and it's spring. Well, that's nice. At least somebody's thought about it. Um, it's the only way you also come across the big hidden gems. I mean, there's huge hope diamonds, like in the middle of Nehemiah 8. Let's face it, Nehemiah is not the most exciting reading in all the Bible, right? But in the middle of Nehemiah 8, you find out that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And uh, the whole book is worth that particular nugget. Um, or, you know, maybe you'll be real entrepreneurial and find a prayer of Jabez. And, and I mean, let's face it, it's buried in the middle of an utterly boring and forgettable list. And, and yet somebody found it and made a fortune on it. Um, my suggestion for exploring is, as I mentioned earlier, simply get it on your phone and then dedicate yourself during one of the seasons to actually listening from start to finish. So say Lent, say Advent, as you're driving to go to your calls, as you're driving to the church, whatever. I mean, spend the time listening. Set it to two times, uh, you know, so, so it's going twice the normal speed. You'd be amazed at how fast it can go. Let, let, let the whole thing wash over you. Don't try to remember what's there. You're, you're, you're exploring. Stuff will stick this time. If it doesn't stick this time, you're going to be exploring later. It will stick next time. Just keep listening and let the words wash over you. But there's also the need to live in your home daily. And for that, I don't think Audible or tapes or whatever is, is the tapes. That dates me. You know what I mean. Um, is the best. For this, you have treasury, or something very like it. Um, treasury, or, or pray now, in my opinion, just tops the other resources because it lets the readings live in their liturgical and uh, ecclesiastical context. And because it's so blasted easy to use, and you have so many lay folk that are actually doing it along with you. I continually find more and more people that that's how they, they read their Bible. Um, they, they, they do it from, uh, from, from Pray Now, actually, more than I think the, the treasury itself. They, they, they just use the app. Um, and, you know, because with the app, you can tell it to put all the stuff in place. <laughs> you don't have to you know, pray matins or vespers or whatever. Um, that's you living in the Word. But the specific word you're to preach on a given week also needs to live in you. So I really think that the best way to do that is sometime Sunday afternoon or evening after you've already preached, you pick up next Sunday's texts and you read them. You read them out loud. You read them to yourself. And you don't worry about the original yet. You just read them the way you're going to read them or have them read in the assembly and let them start living in you. Read them out loud, nice and slowly. Let them start to perk. Start thinking, what does that mean? Do it every single day of the week. Add your study of the original, sure. Look at commentaries. Study how the church preached them across the ages. Don't forget to check the index of your Book of Concord for where they have been used. Or Chemnitz Lochi Theologici, another huge resource with, with all kinds of goodies on specific words. Pick up that wonderful commentary on the Gospels. I can't think of what it was called that Matthew Carver translated for CPH. Do you know what I'm talking about? Christian Day of Grace. Huh? Christian Day of Grace, I think. Christian Day of the Day of Christian Day of Grace? Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 packed full of goodies. Pick up different versions and read those too. And read those out loud. There's always insights there. Do you remember? Jerusalem in the ESV, I think it says, um, that Christ may be all and in all. 
but the Jerusalem Bible rendered that there's only Christ, and he's everything, and in everything. That sticks. It's worth thinking about. Or what about, you remember the famous Philip's rendition of, of Romans 12? Do not be conformed to this world. Do not let this world squeeze you into its mold. Very, very good. My favorite from different versions is, is actually in the AAT, which I don't tend to like very much, but an American translation. It rendered Titus 3 so simply and so well. He saved us by the washing in which he gave us a new birth and a new life. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's j j just a an amazingly clear way of putting it. And if you do German, don't neglect your, your Luther. The Luther Bible has some real goodies. Do you remember the epistle that we had at the divine service that began our conference? It had the line, do the work of an evangelist. And when you hear evangelist, it's carrying baggage in your ear from English, right? And you think Billy Graham or something like that, right? Do you remember how Luther translated it? Do the work of a gospel preacher. Hmm. Good insight and at the heart of what an evangelist is. The new tools make working with the original languages a snap compared to what it used to be. How many of you remember lexicons? <laughs> Do you remember you used to have to go and look up the, the word? And now, what do you do? You tap on it, and up comes the lexic, the, the lex, le, lexic, the information about how it's used in grammar. <laughs> um, and and, and the, uh, the, 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 the definitions, and, and it's, it's just amazing. Think of the agony people went through to make the concordances. You know, and now it's a global search, and boom, there, there it is. So th they're great tools, and they're right there, but we need to use them to the full. So you are in the Word, and the Word in you, and as you examine the Word and the words, don't forget to think in terms of Franzman's hermeneutical circles. Do you remember that? Um, okay. When you're dealing with a specific term and you're pondering it in a text, the first circle is how's it being used in this context, which means don't let the pericope make you forget that there's stuff before and stuff after. You know, find out what it's being used in that context. And then what about further in the book, further in the writings by this same guy? And then how's it used throughout the scriptures? Um, very helpful for tracing it down. Um, this unravels a lot of the logical conundrums. God chose to give us his revelation in story and language through words, and words work in the Bible the way words work in normal usage. A given person doesn't always use the same vocable to mean the same thing. And a given vocable between many people may mean something slightly different, depending on how a speaker is using it in its context, which is a long way of saying that Veltz and the modern school aren't all wrong. Just kidding. Think about how this solves the problem with James and Paul, right? I mean, Rome just looks at that and says, shoot, Lutherans manifestly do not believe what the scriptures say. Because it says with utter clarity, so you see that a man is not justified by faith alone. What is the problem? Why can't you just grant that that's what the scriptures say? Well, why can't we just grant that? Because James actually shades and uses the word faith in a different way or believe in a different way than Paul does. Because there's no way that Paul would ever be able to say the demons also believe and tremble. <laughs> what Paul meant by faith is something entirely, not entirely, is shaded differently than the way James used the word. It doesn't have to be you have to throw James out of the canon. It's just acknowledging mm, uh, James meant by faith more opinion and thinking, stuff in the head, not trusting in the heart. Problem solved. Yeah. James writes to Right. 
right? Well, and especially when he's dealing with the ones in Rome, too. It's, the, the, the big discussion comes in, in, in Rome, right? Well, it, in the Ephesians, it's everywhere. Without the works of the law. And he's really clear. Um, yeah? If you're going to use any of the tools, it's good to start with a prayer asking for humility. Because... I, 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 I have prayer at the end, but it's just good to begin with it. Yes. But we have to. Yep. This is this is what uh, 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 what we heard the other day when we when we have the the description of, of treating it as a science. Yeah. It's not just a science. It's God talking, and when God talks, we listen and we speak. We speak back. So prayer is is at the heart. Um, The, the thing that I like about the way Gerhard operates in his Lochi is he does all the, he does the hard work, the scientific work, if you will, on language. But it always says, so how, and this then leads us to pray thusly. And, and, and it always drives you to how this word of God informs how you speak back to him. And uh, it's very well done. But back to the technical stuff for a little bit more. Um, I, I don't think... Uh, I put this. Words call out to each other and they shade into each other and they have a life of their own. And their history, etymology, it tends to be interesting, but not actually terribly informative about how they're being used at a given time. How I use a word now tends not to take much cognizant of how it was used in ages past, with this exception. When a word lives in living stories, such as we have in the Bible, then I don't think it's an accident. Well, In the Septuagint, which is the basis for your New Testament, let me say it one more time, in the Septuagint, which is the basis for your New Testament, when a word has a life, it's important to notice. Isaac is being sacrificed. What does God say to Abraham about his son? Take your son, your monogenes son. So when monogenes shows up in John, in John 3, it is yanking right back to the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. And you look at it and go, yeah, gave, gave your, gave your, there it is. The sacrifice is right there. So I really think that's a vital thing. And I think we've sort of short shrifted our reading of the Septuagint in a way that's hindered us from hearing the New Testament as fully as we might. Yeah. Why, why is, uh, maybe you're not afraid to totally unpack that word, but why is Ishmael not? I, I don't know. He, he doesn't come from Sarah, so that doesn't make him legit. I mean, more an adopted son, not, not an, a son that actually, I mean, he still comes from Abraham, but Abraham has become one flesh with Sarah, and, and the child was promised to come through Sarah. The, the, the term yeah. itself carries connotations primacy, mm -hmm. not just only preferred. God. Yeah. And so to call Jesus the, you know, the, the favored, the one and only in the sense of, of favored. So it doesn't have to be only in the sense that there is no other. It does in Jesus' case, but it doesn't have to in, in, in Ishmael. And then the other thing is when you look at the Hebraic pattern of comparison, you know, hate your mother and right. father and love, you know, right. it's a matter of Compared to the love for God, your love for your parents is hatred. Compared to his, his the uniqueness of, of, of Isaac, Ishmael is nothing. So, I mean, I guess if we think in those terms, the monogenes of, of, of Jacob would be like Joseph, right? You know, uh, the preferred. I'm, I, I, I don't know. I, I do know, though, that the, pick, the, the way that a Sept, the Septuagint uses ties to the New Testament in a way that we, I don't think we've done a good job of actually 
um, giving credit to. I, I have a friend that uh, he was a Lutheran and he became Orthodox and his, his statement is, the only Hebrew you ever really need to know is LXX. <laughs> I, 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 I disagree, but it's important to remember that LXX is a, uh, a powerful witness to the text that's actually older than what we have in, uh, certainly in the Masoretic text. Uh, anyway, we have the, and by comparing to the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can see um, that the, the fluidity of, of that text um, across those years. I mean, the, the Masoretes received and shaped the text, I believe. There were times that the pointings, if, if I put it this way, if the pointings could be led to point away from Jesus, they did. Um, all right, uh, not really an attack on Hebrew. I love Hebrew too. Um, as the words uh, for this week make their home in you in Perk, as you study and ponder them, as you pray them and hear God speak in them, as he does speak in them, you begin to answer the question we began with. What shall I cry? Through these words, there's always a wonder. There's always something that begins to press itself upon you in awe and astonishment or maybe puzzlement. They lead you to wonder. And with wonder comes the key, I believe, to preaching. The doxological key. There is that in the words which will move you to awe and praise. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, declaring the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When you read the readings, ask yourself, what leads to awe? What leads to praise and adoration here? What in this text shows me that God reveals himself in such a way that I am moved to lift the entire concerns of the world I mean, this is the, the liturgical context, right? Right into the prayer of the church. To lift the entire concerns of the world and those I love to him and know that I'll be heard. What moves me to that? What moves me to praise? And then to run to his sacramental embrace. You remember yesterday I gave you Justin's words. The president of the assembly invites us into the pattern of these beautiful things. And Dr. Stuckwish pointed out that that ends up at the table, of course. The joy in the beautiful things is the joy that moves your feet to the table and opens your mouth to receive God's good gifts. Nagel got at all of this by asking one question of all the texts. What's the Jesus proprium? What is the Jesus these particular readings are giving you that you don't get elsewhere? What's their unique gift? The unique insight they offer, the joyful aha that coheres with all the other ahas, but the, the joy that the church is lifting up this day to celebrate so that God may be praised and his gifts received. Can you take that and put it into a single sentence? If you worry at it and think about it until you can, what in these texts will move the people of God to praise him for his good gifts in Jesus. If you can put that into a single sentence, your sermon writing is almost done with that single sentence. Because, as it's what the homiletics folk call the dominant thought, and, and it's, it, it's like if you tap that gem at just the right spot, it breaks open and it's filled with light. And that light will lead to the people's joy as they join with you, as you hold it up and they, they, they marvel at it. You know, like <laughs> the light that Galadriel gave to, to Frodo. The, you know, this is a light to shine in the darkness when all other lights go out. This is a light that will see them all the way home. This is Isaiah 60, the Epiphany Old Testament reading, the light that shines on a people sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. And when they see the light, it beckons them home and they get up. And together they start marching to Zion and singing its hymns on the way. In that light, they walk toward the source of that light. 
singing with joy. Once they were not a people, now they're the people of God. Once they didn't have mercy, now they have mercy. Last consideration. Should you write it out? I think it depends entirely on you. The church's history has tended to have it written out, and that's been a blessing. Because that means people who are not just there in the assembly, but who can read your words, also get to hear it and think about it and share it. Sometimes others did the writing out. That was usually the case for Luther, you know. He, he, he rattled on and people copied it down and then they handed him a copy and say, is that what you said? And he goes, yeah, mostly. Um, it, it, it's, it's easy for us today, given how easy it is to write things out on, on our electronic devices, uh, to do so and then to share them with those beyond our own immediate Eucharistic assembly that they might have the joy to of learning to praise God for this or that insight that the Holy Spirit gave you from the texts that were before you. And that's about a sum of all that I had to share with you, and I hope that in the jumble of some things, uh, something may have struck a chord here or there and been of use. So I ask you guys now, any questions, comments, insights you want to share uh, as we wrap up? I know we're supposed to do that in the next hour, but I figure we'll do it now. When we're done, we'll say responsive prayer and be done. Yeah? That very last point, um, the comment is, I've heard the comment made that uh, to have it, have your uh, sermons posted on Facebook or whatever the case may be, takes it out of its liturgical setting and it doesn't end up meaning the same thing. Would you care to respond to that? Yeah, I, I think that if it's heard by people in a liturgical setting that are, I mean, people reading, people reading it from inside the church are always going to hear the message in a different way from people reading it outside the church, right? Uh, it's going to be inevitable. But when you post things on Facebook or just on the internet in general, uh, other Christians are particularly blessed by it, and the Holy Spirit may indeed use the word that's there to actually call someone into a Eucharistic assembly, into the place where the gifts are being distributed. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, mean, I, I just, I, I think I love reading sermons that are online or hearing them, e either one. It's actually kind of been a blessing. I got real bummed when Peterson stopped posting his sermons. It's like, gosh, David, I mean, there were amazing stuff in there. On his, oh, you know what? He doesn't have his blog anymore. He was posting them on the blog. That's where I was reading them. Yeah. You talk about the, the specific words and the, and the richness of them. Um, how do you perceive the difference between preaching from a manuscript versus preaching strictly from an outline? Because I, I almost never have a manuscript, mm -hmm. but I think that you lose some probably precision that way. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's like a balancing thing where what you lose in precision, you may gain in actual engagement with the people. Um, so the that's a real factor. But with precision ultimately has to come, it's not a matter just of words, but of clarity of thought. And uh, the words matter. In fact, I, I didn't really deal with it, but there's an entire, I mean, you guys know the, 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 the Enchiridion by, um, by Chemnitz, uh, what did CPH call that? Um, Ministry and Word, Ministry, Word, Sacrum, something like that. It was published at the time of the Reformation with another book. They were always bound together. Urbanus Regis wrote this book called um, How to Speak Correctly. And he begins by excoriating Reformation preachers for saying stupid things in the pulpit, always overstating their point. The classic instance we know from his like, good works are detrimental to salvation. You know what I mean? People were saying stuff like that. Um, and so he was like, you can't do this. Or like he had people that, that would, uh, you know, the mass is evil. It's like, yes! Then you have people despising the Lord's Supper. You don't talk like that. And so the whole book is devised around how you speak carefully. But I think that if you actually get it clear in your head, okay, I'm not going to speak about these topics in a frivolous and careless way, then I'm not sure that it's going to be harmed by not having the manuscript. The danger of not, to me, of not having the not danger, the disadvantage is that it doesn't, it's harder to share. Yeah. In our church, we all, the preachers usually have a, a manuscript which is put out, you know, on mm -hmm. two sides of a sheet of paper in for 
the usher, where the usher is, yep. if anyone wants it, I never use it because it, it depends on your retentive memory. If you've got a good retentive memory, you'll make better connection without reading. Yeah. But if you've written it out in full before, you're less likely to get off the reservation and say stupid things. Right, right. And this is a danger. I have been to services where the pastor preached and I thought, man, you should have a manuscript because you're just wandering around and you're not tying any of this together and it's just, you, know, you need a manuscript. I've been to services where outstanding, wonderful homilies have been delivered where there was zero eye contact and it hurt. It hurt the actual delivery because there was no, I mean, there was no looking up and acknowledging the people. Um, you know, I, 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 th there's a happy medium between those two where I think most of us live. The one thing I didn't notice though we have three services, and I will preach three times. Yeah. And when our senior pastor is with me, it's always I would like listening to you when you preach because all three services are different. Different, right? And right. They all they all have the same exegesis. Right. They all have the same, right. You know, manuscript, but there will be an illustration because of what you see in the, in right. the congregation. You will go for something different because of the age of the people. If you have more young families, or if you have more uh, senior citizens. Something will come to mind, it will yeah. come out of your yeah. mouth, you'll use it. And, and there's so this also fact, something happens when you're preaching too. I mean, this sort of drives me crazy as you see the question come up on the person's face and you want to stop and go, what? Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking? You know, sure. like you would in Bible class, but, but it's at the pulpit, we, we, we tend not to think we have the freedom to do that. And I don't think it's necessarily a good idea. But, but it, I think that shapes sometimes how you're preaching. If you look out there and you see them, like, hmm, okay, let me, let me elaborate this point a little more. Be, be, because it looks like you, you read a question on, on their face. My congregation, the sermons were, um, they still are. They're always printed out. They're available in, in, in manuscript. We always told the people, there's no guarantee that that's what you're getting. <laughs> you know, that, that's printed out for your convenience and if you have trouble hearing something like that will be preached today um, <laughs> the interesting thing that happens is if my wife happens to be at, at, at you know, two different services yeah. she will say that one was so much better than yeah. that and yeah. then a lay person or the, or the senior pastor will have the opposite and so the Holy Spirit will use different things in different ways. Absolutely. Places. Even though it's the same exegesis, the same outline, the same basic content. Right. It will be different. Yeah. Yeah. As Peter can attest, uh, I had a colleague who wrote everything out, but when he got up to the pulpit, he didn't have a note or anything. Mm -hmm. He didn't preach. You did not want to go to the late service because you missed dinner. <laughs> it's Every a challenge, day, right? Everything that was on the desk from the study came out by late service. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is a challenge. You want, I mean, you're going to get all these kind of goodies. I still, re I remember, this is kind of a weird one. I mean, I remember, I, my brother was killed in a car accident when I was on Vicarage. It was Palm Sunday morning. And I remember I had to, pre I was so excited about preaching the sermon. It was on, I I'd had, I used that um, holiday to study the, the Hebrew text for Zechari on Zechariah, and, and I found out that the word gili that's used for um, shout for joy, O daughter of Zion, is, is the cry of the cultic prostitute in her orgasmic ecstasy. Um, and, and, and I thought, oh, pastor, I'm going to get this in there somehow. And he's like, don't you dare. So, I mean, I was already having fun with it, and then that whole thing came up, and I had to, it was like, oh my goodness, can I stand in this pulpit and preach the joy? And you can, because the joy we have is that big. But, same but was, a, was a vacancy preacher at, at where I am now decades ago, and some of the people that remember him will just say, man, I can listen to that guy preach all day. And he would yeah, say, I have listened to him. <laughs> <laughs> All that, right, right. I mean, the temptation is always to pull in all the goodies that have come along in the study. I, I, it's better to make a judicious choice and give them a few. And I think if you leave them wanting more, rather than saying, I wish he'd have shut up 10 minutes ago, we'd, you're in a, a, a better position homiletically. John? I'd like to take the conversation in a slightly different direction. I want to reflect on your homily from yesterday and mm -hmm. the, role of, the role of storytelling Mm -hmm. and, and sermon and sermonizing and, and such. 
I'm, I'm really curious about your take on, on the role of it. You, you obviously see a, a role in it because that's essentially mm -hmm. what you did last evening. Yes. Um, and and I'm, I'm seeing, as the older I get, the more I, wisdom I see in it as compared to a, a, a purely expository type of, yeah. I'm going to tell you what this story means. Right, uh, right. And simply retelling a story um, and letting the story stand on its own. I believe that the story sermon is incredibly valuable. I don't like the story to be an illustration. I, I like the story to be the sermon. Um, and, and I mean, if, if you know the, the writings of Walt Longgren, he was a master of this. He has, you know, he just has the ability to, to take a story, to wrap you into the story and give you the whole gift. He doesn't even have to draw a moral or a conclusion or anything like that. The story does the job. Let me give you my, my favorite example of this. It's, 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 it's just my favorite way to preach Easter. Um, once upon a time, a real time, mind you, not an imagined one, there was a wolf. And he was an awful thing. His smell was so bad. He was always hungry and never full. And he would stick his head out the door of his cave early in the morning and he would and all the sheep would start shaking in their boots and want to run away. And he would say, yeah, you better be shaking because I'm coming out there and one of those days I'm coming out there for you. His name was Death. One day, when he was feeling particularly hungry, he poked his head out the door, and there in front of him was the juiciest, fattest sheep he'd ever laid eyes on, just standing there outside the door. The effrontery of it just about slayed him. He roared. Oh, don't you know who I am? And the sheep said, yes, I know who you are. Oh, aren't you afraid of me? Of you? You've got to be kidding. The wolf drew himself back and he said, that's it, you've had it, lamb chops. I'm gonna take you down. I'm gonna make it awful. I'm gonna make it bloody. And you're gonna be so sorry that you stood here on my doorstep and mocked me. And all the other sheep had gathered around because they'd never seen a sheep stand up to him before. And they thought, Maybe this time the story will have a different ending. But it didn't. He pounced. It was bloody. It was awful. And when it was all done, he let out a big belch. And then he went back into his cave. The thought occurred to him later in the day. That was the tastiest sheep I have ever eaten in my life. I have never had anything that was quite as good as that. And then the more he thought about it, he thought, but I'm not even hungry, but I'm always hungry. Well, no matter. And he went to bed. The next day he woke up and he thought, I don't feel hungry and I don't feel quite right. And throughout the day, the pain in his stomach grew worse and worse. He thought back to the lamb. He thought, if that thing had been poisoned, Oh, by the end of the day, he was laying in the darkness, yammering and yowling, and all the sheep were kind of creeping up outside. So what is going on there? And in the darkness of the night, with one last yowl, there's this splitting. And out steps this man from his stomach. And the wolf goes, what? What are you? And he says, you don't recognize me. And immediately he knew the voice. And he said, you, you're the sheep. And he goes, yes. And how you kept your promise to make that in bloody. But look at you now. You got a hole in your belly. And it ain't never going to seal up. You. He steps outside and he calls the sheep together. And he says, guys, I'm your good shepherd. I got some news for you. He's going to be out in a few days and he'll come after you. And it'll be awful, but it'll be okay. Because I ripped a hole in his belly, and that hole is never going to heal ever again. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one, certainly not that stinky, stupid wolf, will ever take them out of my hand. Amen. A story, right? You can make it bigger or shorter or whatever, but it's the whole sermon. It's not a piece of a sermon. Um, I, I, I really think that that approach tends to work better. Not, not that I'm against illustration. Our Lord used illustration all the time. Um, but I, I think that holding it all together in the short time that we actually have in the divine service for the sermon, uh, put it as one thing helps. No, oh, thought on that. Yeah? Good. A follow-up. I, yeah. I, I like that. I, I appreciate that very much. I uh, follow up to that, and I'll give my preference instead of baiting you. I, I no, also sorry. have a preference for the possibility of imagining the, the backstory of the scriptures. Yeah. And with, with the caveat of giving to the congregation the understanding that, that this is not the scriptures, it's only what could be and possibly may be, to give people the possibility of what else is there, painting the picture of of what is happening there at the well. And I don't think you need to even tell them because I think they all know that. When you start unpacking it and you've entered into one of the characters to give, you, to give it their story, their perspective, they know you don't know exactly what's going on inside of that person's head, but they love it. And it many times gives them a, a powerful insight into what scripture does explicitly say. <laughs> there was a homiletics prophet, I can't remember who it was, <laughs> who said, you know, the thing that pastors really need to learn to do is to use their imagination. <laughs> Dr. Boyer has said, oh, surely not. <laughs> but actually, I disagree. Oh, surely so. Um, the people are not dumb. They know when you're embroidering. The, and there is, I mean, over time, how many of you guys have, have done the Book of God by Longrin? Listen to the whole thing? I mean, you listen to the whole thing or you read the whole thing, you read it, and, and by the time you're done, he does plant pictures in your mind. I mean, you can never get that horrible, gaunt picture of Jeremiah out, 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 of, out of your mind uh, But by the time he's done painting it. But it, it's still, uh, I think, a helpful way. Uh, what a great idea. Tell the Bible as a novel. Tell it from start to finish as a novel. Uh, it, 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 Even rearranged it. Oh, yeah. He, he rearranged it on the assumptions of higher criticism. Sure. You know, so it, it, it made consistent sense from where he was coming from. Yeah. I, I would encourage anybody, if you have had the opportunity to attend um, any seminars of Dave Schmidt, Dave Schmidt. Yeah. At, at, at Concordia. Mm -hmm. And he does these around the country and he teaches narrative preaching. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Yeah. So I mean, I, I just encourage you. Don't be afraid of it. Um, preaching doesn't always have to be um, expository. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Luther's house apostles yesterday. I like how Luther does it there, where he he'll read the text, that if, if especially if it's narrative, you know, what the character spoke, and he'll say it is as if he said, and then yeah. he, then he takes it and just blows it up. Right? Yeah. 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 He does. He does that a lot. That, does, that, that, yeah. that's, that's one of one of his gifts is he'll, he will invite you into it with the as if right um, yeah very good that's in the uh, uh, um, preparation for the Lord's Supper it's as if he said right yeah yeah for confession yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Re regarding jumping back to uh, publishing your, your sermons online I've got a number of different comments to make on that first of all it's, it's no different than publishing or having a copy of Luther's sermons I mean, right or Chris systems or whatever. Yeah. I mean, we've, got, we've got books of sermons from all over. And secondly, when you preach, your preaching of the gospel belongs to the church. You know, it's, it's not just for you, it's not just for your congregation, it's for the whole church. So let the whole church have it. Which then, if you are quoting someone in your sermon, uh, my personal preference is don't waste any words saying, and thus says so and so in his such and such. Work. Just say it. You know, the, you know we, 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 we see this, uh, Matthew actually kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes he'll say, you know, as was written in the prophet Jeremiah, or sometimes he'll say, as was written in the prophets. Sometimes things just get quoted. And just, so in your manuscript, you know, make a note, hey, I got it from this source, so that if right. anybody 
asks you, you can, you can point at them. But yeah. you know, the people don't need to hear this, this, this person said this, this point. In time. Just, just preach it. It belongs to you. There's, there's no such thing as plagiarism in the church because it all belongs to the church. I, I like it. And I, th I think it's important for us just to uh, a acknowledge it, sermons are not research papers and they don't have footnotes. <laughs> So if you're, if you're doing that, I mean, just literally, so I came from Luther, whatever, just put a parenthesis, Luther. If somebody wants to know where you got it from in Luther, they can ask. Oh, where, where did he say that? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll tell you where. Um, but uh, yeah, I agree, I agree. It, everything belongs to the church. I wish we remembered that about our liturgy. Uh, yeah. On that point, I bicker with Dr. W. Harry Krieger, who was a great preacher in our church. And um, I, I can remember him saying, not everybody is creative. Mm -hmm. says, if you're not that creative, says, don't ever be afraid to borrow from other people who are, and don't ever apologize for it. Do you remember in Luther's, uh, <laughs> in his treatment of the German bass, he begins by talking about preaching, and he says, you know, I really think maybe we should just have these things published and printed so that people could just read them because some people just can't do better than this. <laughs> not, he's, I'm not saying that, that I'm the best, but he's saying, if you can't do this well, then borrow these. Yeah, so I mean, we, we should feel free. And I like that, it's the, it's, it belongs to the entire church. Yeah. Just, just be sure that you're not saying that, that uh, Prince Frederick is still the elector of sex. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> you might wanna update some things. Yeah, good, 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 excellent. Anything further? To that point, we also, you know, have some tradition of, of reading specific homilies at, on specific feast days. I don't know, like Easter Vigil, I like to read the, the I think it's the Chrysostom, right? Uh, the Paschal homily. Yeah. That, that that's, uh, that's given to us. In, in right. Some. I mean, that is, you know, you guys know that homily, right? The, the, the Paschal homily of St. John Chrysostom? If you don't, save yourself the agony and preach it on Easter. <laughs> Like the, so concise, so short, so wonderful, full of grace. Um, forgiveness is risen from the dead. Pardon is risen from the grave. Uh, it's just really great, great stuff. If you don't use it at church, we actually used it at home this year at the, the dinner table. Uh, one of our Easter guests said, we have that tradition in our family that we always read it on, on Easter at the table. And I said, well, let's do it. And we pulled out the treasury and it's, 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 it's the reading for Easter for the treasury. Um, CPH published, not CPH, um, the reporter published it as an insert years ago with a very fine translation, better than what's in Treasury. Um, and I, I can't remember uh, whence, whence they got that. It was many years ago. It was when uh, Commission on Worship was Dodd Paul. Yeah, it was, in, it was a Commission on Worship insert. Yeah. A couple of on um, story sermons, because I've been doing those periodically for years and years, really since, since I was ordained. And, the, and a couple of dangers is one, it, it's can't give people a study diet of that. No. Every time I've done one, some people will say, man, that was just the most awesome thing ever. And other people walk out like, I got up to hear you tell stories. You know, it, it, it doesn't register with everybody. Yeah, so I, I totally it, believe so. that, that they, of all sermons, cannot be done constantly. I do think they lend themselves to being done. Um, this is sort of a Missouri Senate tradition during Lent, in the midweeks, um, to bring them into the passion, to let them witness the passion from the inside. Um, I, I am a, I know it's not popular anymore, but I'm still a big believer that you read the passion during the Lenten midweeks. I know that's not the only thing Lent's there for, but that is a priceless heritage we have as Lutherans that shaped us as a people for a long time here in this country, that on those Wednesdays in late winter, the people of God gathered and spent time on the way to the cross and at the cross. I, I think it's, it's, it's just beautiful and vital. I'm not even opposed to the stupid conflation in the book. I, I think that giving them, I say stupid because, well, I mean, you know, it's kind of, it's ne you can't make it smooth. It's never going to be smooth. But, but if you actually do it, um, you can take the years if you're doing the three-year series and do like, okay, we're going to be reading um, whatever passion during Holy Week, so we'll take the next one and preach that during the midweeks. 
Um, or preach the one that's going to be preached during Holy Week and give it to them twice. Yeah. Well, and then the other danger, I think, too, is that, like I've always said, that preaching is not a written medium, which is one of the reasons I, I, don't, I don't tend to even like to read sermons too mm -hmm. much. I think it's a spoken medium. But when you, when you do story sermons that and it goes to the prayer for humility kind of thing, mm -hmm. it's also not a performance. Right. And I think it's very easy to slip into, I'm performing for you now yeah. when you're doing a story sermon. Yeah. And yeah, that's a problem too. it is a problem. It's a problem in how we read the scriptures too. There's like this fine balance between, you know, I will not, I will not allow any human emotion to come through my words as I <laughs> deliver these words to you, versus, you know, and then he said, you know, I mean, yeah, they're, 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 I, I think we happily live somewhere in between in the readings and certainly in the sermons, and, and I think with the story sermons. Uh, <coughs> If the goal that they came out with, if they come out saying, that was a great story, it was a failure. If they come out saying, that is a great God, you know that the sermon did what you wanted it to do. Yes, sir. A couple of thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as that uh, balance issue, um, uh, a certain tall, skinny, balding uh, homiletics professor to the east of us uh, did his doctorate on his doctoral uh, study specifically was on the how well uh, people hear and understand uh, the points of law and gospel mm -hmm. uh, from the different types of sermons. Mm -hmm. And he found that narrative, uh, they, the people that listened to certain narrative sermons didn't get it as, as clearly. De deductive was the clearest way to present it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, he, but he also said that uh, having a healthy, uh, me personally, I like inductive, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, that's out, kind of somewhere between deductive and story, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and that's how I like to think. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, having a balanced diet, I guess you might say. But the other thing about the story, the narrative sort of thing is, what are we doing when we are preaching and it is a sacramental sermon and, and it is uh, uh, bringing the word <coughs> of life and delivering it into their ears and pulling them into, into the, uh, the life of Christ that, you know, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, that's my history. That's right. your history. Right. That's your story. Right, right. Um, so we hear it. <laughs> I heard many years ago uh, Susan Briel uh, talk at the Valpo Institute, and uh, she talked about uh, how her kids would ask for the tuck me in story. Did you hear that presentation? It's just amazing. She goes, this is, what, this is what actually what preaching does, is it tucks you into God's story, puts you into the story. It's your, your story. Yeah. The reason that I think I know that the, the, the story on the lamb and the, uh, the wolf and all that Remember my friend Charlie I told you about? Vinny, Charlie's funeral, right? Okay, when Charlie's, mother, uh, Charlie's wife's father died, it was the week after that sermon was delivered for the first time at St. Paul's. And Charlie said, all the way up the road, I kept saying to Lola, honey, it's okay. That damned wolf has a hole in his belly. Don't forget the hole. And I thought, Ah, he's holding on to what was the, the, the awe and joy of, of um, John 10, truthfully, you know. Good, 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 good. Good thoughts. Yeah. I, I saw one story sermon go kind of overboard and it really made me uncomfortable. Um, but the uh, pastor uh, disappeared for the, like, the hymn of the day and then came out uh, dressed as John the Baptist. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, Would you turn it into a stage? <laughs> well, he was walking up and down talking to us like we were um, trying to get baptized by him. And it was really, it was really strange. <laughs> and I, I couldn't, it just, it was so awkward to, to go into that and then to go into the Lord's Supper. Yeah. 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 That's a great litmus test right there. Is how well does it fit 
leading you into what's coming next. And if it doesn't, if it's jarring, it doesn't, I mean, that's a good sign. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't go there. I mean, I mean, I, I, I think that, I think that it can be, I had a friend, um, she is, uh, she serves in the ELCA. Um, she, her, she told me about this sermon she did, and I was like, you did that? She, she got in the pulpit, and she says, she looked at the people, she said, I'm sorry, I th- thought about it this week, I think it's all a bunch of bunk, I don't believe it. And she got out of the pulpit and walked out the aisle and waited about a minute. And then she turned around and walked back in and said, gotcha, didn't I? And got in the pulpit, she wanted them to think in terms of uh, do, 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 why do you believe what you believe about this, this Jesus? Why do you believe it? I think, I mean, I thought, eh, it's right up there with, with dressing up like John the Baptist. Um, but I don't doubt that for the people that, that heard, I mean, I'm sure they, that's a sermon that they probably never will ever forget. And then she, she went on to talk about why I believe the resurrection is the cornerstone that cannot be, cannot be denied. Um, it was, it was a, a, an interesting way to get at it. Yeah. Since we're telling stories, there's a famous Episcopalian pastor who was uh, preaching on mammon. And so he, he pulled out a cigar at the beginning of the sermon. He lights it up. He starts smoking, right? And then he says, you think that's offensive? Then he pulls out a 20 and he lights the 20 with the cigar. He says, this is your God. Watch it burn, you know? Whoa! <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> Sometimes an object lesson, you know. I would have preferred to use a sensor. That has to do with the offerings, I forget. Yeah, God. Back part of the rest of the card. Bishop Vickerish and I did a series of first person sermons at Lent, which I think there's, as you already pointed out, there's possibilities. You have to. It takes a little bit more preparation and such. And it was, mm-hmm. the, you know, it was, and the, the best one, finally, I think, worked the best was Good Friday because he he, he started with, uh, we, the Good Friday one was, no, it was Monday Thursday, where it was a, uh, the first person sermon was on um, Judas, and the, the story was on the denial. Uh-huh. And it was finally, um, uh, he started his homily was on basically condemning Judas uh, to hell because of his denial of Jesus, and um, and he, he went in. He, he, he was really going off a tangent that was close to heresy about uh, things that I was the first person sermon Judas from the back, and I ended my piece with God could never forgive me, ah. uh, and that he. He, his challenge to the congregation was, what do you think? You know, could God ever forgive? And, and then what followed was uh, confession and absolution. And so it was a little bit of a strange order to things in the, in the, uh, in the mass that they, in the divine service that they did before. Actually. But, but it worked pretty well uh, because of the way, and I think, although we didn't think about it the way you just said, but because of the way it was placed in the divine service and what we thought about and what followed afterwards. It, uh, it fit. Such. I, I, I want to pick up that it's, it's, it's a strange place for it. Do you guys remember, I mean, did you know that in Saxon liturgy, the confession and absolution comes after the sermon? It's after the pastor has preached that he turns to the people and says, having now heard the word of God, let us make a confession of our sins, <laughs> saying, O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father. Um, I, I've always found, I mean, in Sinnott's first liturgy in German and her first liturgy in English, that's the, which preceded the common service by six, seven years. The, the myth that the Missouri Synod didn't put her worship into English early on is just, it's a myth. Um, uh, th- th- three profs from Concordia Seminary worked on Englishing they, they, they didn't quite get where the accents fell, <laughs> which could be really funny. Which from thine own mother, Marie, came. Mary, M-A-R-Y. 
but uh, 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 a fascinating, fascinating thing. I, you, when you mentioned the Good Friday, I, I have to bring you a homily from the ancient church. Short. What do you do with the dialogue like this? Pilate fixed three crosses on Golgotha, two for the thieves, one for the giver of life. When hell saw it, he said to those below, My ministers and powers, who has fixed a nail in my heart? A wooden lance has suddenly pierced me, and I'm being torn apart. My insides are in pain. My belly is in agony. My senses and my, sp my spirit tremble, and I'm compelled to disgorge Adam and Adam's race. All men were given to me by the garden's tree, but now a tree is bringing them back again to paradise. And when he heard this, Satan, that cunning serpent, ran crawling and said, What is it, hell? Why are you groaning for no reason? Why produce these wailings? This tree at which you tremble, I carpented it up there for Mary's child. I suggest it to his enemies for our advantage. For it's a cross to which I have nailed Christ, wishing by a tree to do away with the second Adam, just as I did away with the first one. Don't be afraid. It's dry and barren. It won't harm you. Keep hold of those you have. Of those we rule, not one will escape again to paradise. But Hal replied to Satan, You've lost your senses, you cunning snake of old. All your wisdom has been swallowed up by the cross, and you have been caught in your own snare. Lift up your eyes and see that you've fallen into the pit you dug. Behold the tree you call dry and barren. It bears fruit. A thief tasted it, and he's become heir to the good things of Eden. Moses' rod led the people out of Egypt, but this tree brings mankind back again to paradise. Satan answered, Wretched hell, you stop this cowardly talk. Your words reveal your thoughts. Are you afraid of a cross and of the crucified? Not one of your words has shaken me. These deeds are part of my plan. I will also have a grave and entomb Christ so that you may enjoy your cowardice doubly from his tomb as well as from his cross. When I see you, I will mock you. For when Christ is buried, I will come to you and say, And who now brings Adam back again to paradise? Then hell spoke back. Now's the moment for you to listen, Satan. Now you will see the power of the cross and the great authority of the crucified for the cross. The cross is folly, but the world sees it as a throne on which, as though seated, Jesus is nailed and hears the thief cry, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Listen now as he answers kingly, today, poor beggar, you will reign with me, for with me you will go again to paradise. At these words, Satan began to wilt and when he heard what he saw, a thief witnessing to Christ crucified, and so amazed, he struck his breast and said, Christ did not answer his accusers, and yet he speaks to a thief. To Pilate, he never spoke a word, but now he addresses a murderer, saying, come live in pleasure? What is this? Who has seen words or deeds done by this thief by means of which he may go again to paradise? Again, the devil called, receive me, hell. I turn to you. I submit to your views. I, who did not believe them, I saw the tree at which you shuddered made red with water and blood. And I shuddered, not I tell you at the blood, but at the water. For the blood shows Jesus' slaughter, but the water shows his life. Life gushed from his side. It's not the first, but the second Adam who carried Eve, the mother of all the living, again to paradise. And hell and Satan cry out together, let's lament this tree, this tree planted, transformed into a holy trunk beneath which thieves, murderers, tax collectors, harlots find shelter and reap sweet fruit from what seemed barren. They cling to the cross as the tree of life, pressed against it and swimming, they escape and come again to a harbor, again to paradise. What do you think? Would it preach on Good Friday? Mm -hmm. Romanos the Melodist. An ancient, you know, uh, an ancient writer from the, uh, the Eastern Church, hymnist. But uh, he does it by story, a very imaginative telling of the story, a conversation between Satan and, and Hades. How can anybody know what's going on between Satan and Hades? But at the same time, he, he, by doing it, he unpacks the gospel, I think, in a way that, when I've used it, people have been very, very blessed over time to say, yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that that, that that Satan totally blew it, and that makes it clear. What's the what's, hoisted by his own petard? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the other extreme, in terms of types of sermons, yeah. uh, Richard Kimber Sr., the great yes. Bloody's professor, mm -hmm. in the classroom, trying to show us what to do and not to be too mechanical, you know, with the gold malady. Right, and right, that, right. And, his. Uh, and this may be an apocryphal story, but it was powerful for us. The congregation was, they were at each other's throats, pointing violence. Oh dear. Sunday morning, they packed the church. You 
know, everybody was there. The senior pastor got up in the pulpit and said, there's only a voice of preaching chamber senior can use. There is no word of God today in heaven. Wow. You're going to have to repeat that a little bit louder. So there is no know. word from God today. And walked out. Yeah. Kemmer was rather soft-spoken. Yeah. But he had that kind of voice, like O.P. Creston did, that he could whisper in a giant room and you could hear it. Yeah, yeah. We are past time. So we need to, uh, to wrap up. But thank you guys so much for the, for the discussion. And uh, ideas that come along or that perk in your mind out of this, please shoot me an email. Let me know what you're thinking further. It's a, it's a problem I think we all need to work on together. Thanks a lot.